Hi, welcome to the show everyone. So on today's show, I've got Chris Fairfax. Now Chris co-founded his first company, Positive Lending, which they grew to over 50 employees with revenues of over 5.5 million per year. So Chris recently exited that business and he now runs Catalyst, who are a specialist bridging lender with over 20 staff. So I hope you enjoyed today's show guys. Some really, really interesting insights from a local property leader. Thank you. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for coming on. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Very good, mate. Very good. Looks nice and sunny where you are today as well, on the terrace of your yep. office space. I come to you from the terrace of The Hive, which is our self-titled uh, office space. And um, yeah, very sunny today. It's lovely. Good stuff, good stuff. So first question we always jump into um, is, what do you think the definition of a leader is? Or in your mind, what is the definition of a leader? Well, I think that uh, you know, leadership in my in my mind evolves over time. It's it, it's different at different stages of your um, you know your running of a business. Uh, certainly, in the kind of very early days of Catalyst, uh, when you've got a relatively small business, and you know you're a lot more at the coal face, um, it's very much leading leading by example. And obviously, leading by example exists in you know. Yeah, at all times of, of leadership. But for me, it was very much, I was, you know, every single phone call that I used to take mm. in the early days, I, I made a point of making sure that I, I had it on speaker. Because okay. we're very much a, a catalyst about people, obviously going through a, a training period, but also, you know, you learn vicariously. And um, it's really the way that I learned during you know when I was when I was first involved in FS mm -hmm. so every single phone call would be on speaker they would hear what I was saying they would hear what the you know the um, what the other person was saying at the end of the call and you know I'd be doing everything I'd be dealing with accounts I'd be dealing with the accountants I'd be dealing with sales you know, every single part of the business I'd be involved in and I think by doing that Everybody in the office, and, and, and to this day, everybody gets to know how I operate. And uh, it's something which I'm really keen on doing. But I suppose leadership is about, you know, you have to set the direction of travel. Um, you have to set the, the destination. So what, you know, what are we trying to achieve as a business? What's our purpose? Um, part of that is also about making sure that you're, you know, communicating that destination. And there can be kind of obviously long-term goals and short-term goals. And, you know, there'll be times when you have to, you know, change, you know, your your kind of purpose slightly. Um, and then you have to bring in the right people. You know, in the early days, you know, I was, every single person that came in through the door was recruited by me. They were interviewed by me. Um, nowadays, you know, I. You know, I, I tend to interview most people, but also I leave it to, you know, some of the uh, senior management team to interview people. Um, and then once you've got a good team of people, you then have to uh, give them as a leader the tools to be able to maximize their performance. And that can mm. be through training. It can be through you know, making sure that, you know, the proposition at kind of like a top level in terms of its strategy is right. Mm. Um, and then you have to also inspire. So I think that you have to motivate people and you have to recognize how every different character within the business uh, is motivated. Um, mm. Some people are financially motivated. Some people are task, you know, orientated where they just love, you know, the com going from having a, an inquiry and then getting to completion. That's what, mm. that's how they get their kicks. And during, you know, during COVID, we, I've had a responsibility as a leader to make sure that you're managing people's, you know, wellbeing, um, mm. to make sure that, you know, you know, it's mental health week. Um, so having an awareness of, of that as well. So, you know, it's all encompassing, um, but ultimately it's about making sure that you're, you're setting the destination and then you're doing everything you can to make sure that your people are given everything they they need to you know to get to that destination how do you so it's interesting to say about you know a destination so for the for the company 
or for you as an individual, do you look at it as how do you articulate that destination to your team? And did you do that when you were a team of two or three, or did you? When did you articulate that destination to the team? How did you do it? No, no, it's 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 a relatively new thing because when you have a, you know, a, an infant as a business, mm. you you're not really setting long-term goals. So I, I, I certainly wasn't. It was really about in the early days. Uh, setting probably like quarterly targets and those yeah. would be around you know for us and you know in, in any lending organization the key thing or key two things are you know your capital and also yeah. your, your people and your process so for me in the early days it was about not so much communicating the long-term vision and also because you're such a small business you're sitting day to day 40, 50 yeah. hours a week amongst the people that yeah. are doing everything, they kind of know what's going on because mm. you're not big enough that nobody has an appreciation of, you know, the day-to-day -day business. Nowadays that we're, you know, we're 20 staff, you know, the, the vision is communicated through, you know, all hands meetings, which yeah. is normally once a month where myself and the senior management team will, um, you know, we have already communicated some of the core objectives of the business over one, three, five years. Yeah. And then we have certain metrics in place that, you know, we are looking to achieve. And those can be, you know, um, you know, quantifiable and mm. some stuff which are, you know, is more qualitative in nature. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, as a S&T and as a you know, chief exec, you know, my responsibility is to make sure that, you know, people know what those short medium and long-term goals are what the metrics are to manage you know what we consider to be successful outcome and mm. um making sure that it's understood and you know we're, we're, we're hitting those targets and if we're not you know enacting change to try and improve things how do you if you're not hitting the targets or the metrics that you're looking for from an individual or as a group how do you kind of how do you deal with that um well if it, some things are easy to change, some things are easy to change. So if, for example, um, it's, you know, you're not hitting sales targets because, you know, you simply are not completing enough loans, then you just have to go, you know, through the process. So we will obviously understand, broadly speaking, where our conversion is. So we know that in order to complete 50 loans a month, we have to originate a certain number of inquiries. Yeah. And then from those inquiries, we have to convert those to a certain number of applications. So mm. when it's something that's fixed, it's then a question of, okay, why are we not completing as much business as we, we should be doing, or we have done mm. in the past, or we thought we were doing? And it's saying, is it something, identifying the problem? So is it because we are not um, competitive in terms of our, you know, we, we lend money to people, you know? so. Yeah it's very much a black and white business in some respects where if your pricing mm. is just not at the races or mm. the market has shifted because it's constantly moving in terms of you know every other lender's pricing then mm. it's really easy for us to, you know within certain tolerances to enact that change quickly it's as simple as saying we need to be we're at 0.79 we need to be at 0.69 you know yeah, and, yeah. Then it's a, and then it's a question of you know can we communicate these changes to the market quickly and can we try and increase uh, volumes of originations? Mm. But also, there are other levers that you can pull in terms of, you know, you can tweak proc fees, you know, what brokers are paid for introductions. Yeah. The, the things that can be more challenging are things that are not within your control. So when you're relying on, you know, third parties, for example, you know, we mm. as, a, as a lender, we're relying on lots of professional third parties, things like valuers, solicitors, asset managers, quantity mm. surveyors, and, you know, we pick our partners very carefully, but mm. if there's a part of the chain which is coming under stress, and solicitors are a great example at the moment because they are inundated Definitely. with, yeah. it's really, it's, you know, it's, it, everything mm. is super slow, you know, there's lots mm. of fiscal stimulus, to, you know, March was the highest gross mortgage lending in the history of mortgage lending. Yeah. You know, solicitors are, yeah. you know, feeling the, feeling, feeling the they're pain. taking, feeling the pain. Mm. That's harder 
that's harder mm. to, to, to fix because you know it's a it's a problem which you know ultimately you know they can't magic up a, you know there's only so many hours in the day people you know they're already working probably longer hours than they should be um mm. you kind of you know just need to look at things and say well you know are there certain things about the process that we can help you with so we can you know bring in you know internally some of those admin tasks mm. you know can you look to diversify your solicitor panel so you're mm. you know you're you're bringing on more people but ultimately mm. they're all in the same boat they're all struggling mm. so you know internal things relatively easy much easier external stuff slightly slightly harder but also like the internal uh, you know things that aren't so focused on just you know quantitative things pricing some of the things that are perhaps you know attitude driven uh culturally driven you know yeah take a little bit more time and it's you know you have to try and change it through training people as you've um how do you deal personally with things that are out of your control as a business is it is it something that you've learned to kind of accept and try and become is it something that used to make you frustrated and outly you know angry or is it something you've always been good at internalizing as a leader and just because it's tricky isn't it it's a bit of a minefield especially when stress is on your shoulders yeah i mean luckily i'm i'm quite a relaxed person i don't think that you can be in this business and be you know really highly strung because it is innately a stressful occupation you're mm. dealing with you know the you know the lending of you know hundreds of millions of pounds and you know things don't always go according to plan and you know you need to have quite you need to be quite calm because ultimately if you're not you can make really bad decisions um, but um i think that i have learned over the years to be to be more patient yeah. and also i've learned that you have to give autonomy to people within your organization and you have to trust them to do a good job not necessarily immediately but if you if you continue to micromanage and you also don't allow people the opportunity to learn by their own mistakes they're actually never going to progress and i think one of the one of the biggest mistakes I made in my first business, which was a um, you know fairly large specialist brokerage, mm. was the and it was partly ego driven, and it was partly driven by just a, uh, the fact that I just would not uh, let go of control. Certainly on some of the bigger sales, was mm. that it got to a point where I was contributing, you know, in a team of 50, 25 percent of the sales revenue. And that's great for me because, you know, I'm getting press releases and, you know, I'm doing, mm. you know, multi-million man deals, but ultimately it's really bad for the business in the long term because yeah. there's two reasons. Number one, you know, no business should be reliant on its MD. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. ultimately, you know, you, 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 you know it, it makes it troublesome if you want to try and realize any of the enterprise value in the future mm. because you're going to be like forever locked in. Mm. unless you can kind of devolve some of that sales responsibility to others mm. and also you know people aren't benefiting there, there's so much experience gained by one person in an organization of 50. so all of that experience that i was harnessing was not being shared amongst the organization you know it was being shared again vicariously like people knew what was going on but they didn't actually there's nothing you know going and pitching a developer to look after their 30 million pound development facility and being in that boardroom environment hearing it from me and doing it are two completely different things um mm. and that was a bit that was a mistake um and i'm very mindful in the new business uh that i need to give autonomy to the staff mm. and i need and i and i tried to do it as early as possible because also the major stakeholders that engage with catalyst are key brokers or all of our brokers you know solicitors when you set the expectation from the get-go that it's not going to be me you're dealing with and then you have to go through this process of going oh i'm kind of stepping back a little bit now you know yeah. you're not dealing with me anymore you're dealing with you know xyz mm. they, they can take offense to it yeah uh, and it's I a difficult yeah it's a difficult process to go through mm. so from the get-go you know 
and people think that it's me being lazy yeah but it's yeah. Very, it's 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 entirely not you, my time is focused on completely different things and um you know the the day-to-day -day running business is you know, i've got to a point now where if i were not here for you know a, a fair amount of time the, the business would run and um yeah you know, that's good you talked about you talked about trust chris of um employee you know in part, of your, in part of your team and obviously being able to give them autonomy and i imagine until you trust them you wouldn't really want to give them too much autonomy is there a period of do you go into a new hire and go i'm going to trust you straight away or do you want to give them an opportunity to earn their trust and and how do how do you how do you recognize that now is it just a feeling that you're like okay i trust this person or is it based on performance there's definitely an incubation period, 100%. We wouldn't, um, you know, we wouldn't allow somebody like completely unfettered you know, autonomy to go and, you know, make, you know, key decisions um, until we thought that they were ready. So yeah. I'd say there's, you know, there's no kind of defined period of time which we think, okay, we don't trust you. Now we trust you. Yeah. It's more about. Um, you know, we we have quarterly reviews with, with, with all staff, um, mm. and it's kind of like it depends what level they come in at. But often it's kind of you give them a little bit more autonomy, and it's done in like baby steps. Yeah. So it might be yeah. okay, you couldn't do this. You, you know, we we now trust you to do this. Um, mm. And then the next month it might be okay, you've mastered that. You can now you know go and do a presentation to one of our you know, key accounts without me or James or one of the other guys being with you, you can do it on your own. So yeah. I think it's just, you know, it, 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 it really varies depending on each member of staff. And, um, you know, you just have to, that's what, you know, kind of like the appraisals are there for to, to give people feedback on their performance and to then to, you know, loosen the reins. And sometimes you have to tighten the reins as well. You have to say to people, you know what, we gave you that autonomy. We don't think that, you know, you're actually performing as you should. Um, so we're going to, you know, we're going to just hold off on that. You know, we're going to give you a little bit more training. Um, you know, you can shadow me or you can shadow, you know, one of the other guys. And, and then perhaps in the future, you'll, you'll, be, able to you'll be ready. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go back to, let's go back to the start, Chris. What was yeah. your first pay? Were you, were you the guy at school that was, that was going to buy sweets from Bookers and trying to sell them on to make a profit. Were you entrepreneurial? Did you do you see any of that in you when you were young? Now looking back, hundred percent. It was a very very cliche, you know. For you know, a, a, I wanted to be a businessman. I've always really? wanted to be in business. I was. When did you When did you realise that? When did you start thinking about stuff like that? I suppose it was kind of yeah no probably yeah probably secondary school probably like the early years of secondary school I was the kid that exactly as you just described would be going to bookers buying yeah. you know, big, big boxes of sweets selling them doubling your money um, you know I was the kid that was doing car washes you know yeah. around the neighborhood for five pounds mm. um, you know I had paper rounds at 13 where the, the, the paper rounds where you would have to uh, deliver a thousand papers well it was kind of <laughs> like that you you'd have um you'd get delivered the day before the papers and then also you'd get the the print advertising these like separate things you had them all in little stacks and i can remember in my parents lounge we'd have the tv on and yeah. it was a bit of a family affair where everybody would kind of chip in and you had to get each one of the print um, like A5 flyers and then put it inside. I think it was the, yeah. I can't remember the name of it, like the advertiser, I think it was called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had an old pram, one of the old mm. old style prams, like the Victorian things, where they're yeah. kind of sus on big wheels and suspended. And I used to load up these papers and I used to, I can't remember how it was, it was like 150. Mm. But compared to doing another paper round, because you were doing the, putting the flyers in, you got yeah. paid a bit more. You, you, I think you got something like, it was like 18 pounds. And like yeah. 18 pounds yeah. to a 12 year old is an absolute Lots. fortune. <laughs> it's a lot of sweets. And then I probably re reinvested in sweets yeah, and double and double the money. So I was very much kind of money orientated. I then had a, I had a, a at school in secondary school when I was about 14, I had a two hour job after school each night cleaning the classrooms mm. in the school, which I loved. It was really well paid compared to other things. And then I moved yeah. on my, after that I had a job a uh, ski center and because yeah. a few of my mates uh, it was a kind of a these dry slopes and yeah, um, yeah. 
I started off hurling, you know, petrified children in yeah. windows down yeah. the, the down slopes too. Eventually, I, I got moved indoors to selling uh, ski wear and boots and in the yeah. ski shop, and I loved that job. I, it was the it was the first experience I had in in sales, mm. and despite the fact that I had never stepped foot in a ski resort or skied or snowboarded mm. i realized that you like sales you don't necessarily need to have been through the experience it's very mm. much about you need to understand your products you need yeah. to listen to what people want and you need to explain to them um mm. and i did really well i really really enjoyed that i was you know selling you know loads of stuff um I don't, Did I don't you know. just just get just going back, Chris? Sorry as well. You know, you clearly like you know you've got that entrepreneurial streak in you from a young age. Was there any? What was what was the influence on that? Was it just? Did you? Was there someone that you looked up to? Someone in your family, relatives, someone famous, celebrity? I don't know. Was there anyone that you kind of put up on a pedestal? Or like they're they're a, they're a great businessman. They that looks like something I want to do. Do you remember that? No, no, I don't think I had any anybody that you know. There was, there was nobody certainly within the family that that ran a business, and you know, I thought I I, I really admire you. I really want to follow in your footsteps. My yeah. my father was a plumber, but he had his own business. He was self employed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there was an element of seeing him. Uh, you know, he always kind of said, you know, working for people is a mugs game, um, mm -hmm. and he'd always been self employed and. I think that kind of rubbed off on me a little bit. You know, I, I kind of thought that, you know, I would, I was employed for a very, very short period, you know, in my, my overall career. So I think there's yeah. definitely an element of that. But also I, you know, and I still am, I'm, you know, I came, I didn't come from, you know, I don't have, you know, so a kind of a, a vision of, you know, the kind of like uh, Oliver, you know, where we were, yeah. all, you know, in, you know the trousers didn't fit and we were all eating porridge it was it was I had a very very happy childhood but i was from a you know working class background yeah but i went to a grammar school where there were people that were from you know middle and you know upper classes and i think from that seeing the uh you know the difference in the way people lived you know it was like a brand new world to me you know yeah different bigger houses cars and i know it's incredibly materialistic but i was you know in my formative years as a you know 11 12 13 year old yeah it has an influence on you and i was like right i want i want more yeah and mm -hmm. and that was really it i knew that i had to no one was gonna give it to me i had to go out and graph for it and that was the start um, mm. And I've kind of carried that attitude throughout my entire life. Um, so I suppose it's a bit of a chip on my shoulder. Which, um, it's an interesting, it it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting angle, isn't it? Because, you know, like you said, you, you weren't from a, you know, a, a really poor background. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of people that are, you know, a lot of sports people, don't they, for example, come from really hard backgrounds. And they've got that just, in, that, that work ethic just absolutely instilled in them. And it's really interesting that, you know, like you said, you had a really happy childhood, everything was, you know, you were comfortable, but you went to a school which basically showed you that there's people that are incredibly wealthy or just very fortunate, aren't they, with generational kind of family wealth or whatever. Yeah. Um, that that gave you the drive in there, because that sounds like that's the thing that gave you the chip in the trailer, like you said, the drive to then go, right, I want to kick on, I want to have what they've got. If you'd gone to another school, if you'd gone to a local, you know, not a grammar school, do you think it would have been the same thing for you? No, I don't. I don't. I think um, I think going to the grammar school was probably the single most influential um, part of my life. Mm. And, uh, uh, f you know, for those of you listening, Tim and I went to the same secondary school in Bournemouth. We did indeed. Um, <laughs> Tim was the... Tim was, you, you will not believe it, but Tim was actually the year above me, uh, yeah. <laughs> which means that he is actually older than I'm not, me. I've not worked hard enough. This you certainly have. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, undoubtedly, you know, first of all, it was an amazing learning environment, 100%. Yeah. Secondly, it, it certainly gave me 
uh, you know, a, access to a, a different uh, figuration. You know, there were there was a network there that, you know, once you start to see the possibility, yeah. and you think, do you know what, I you know I can do this. I can do this, and it wasn't like I, I wasn't twelve thinking I want to be a multi multi millionaire. Yeah. Um, but you know, you got to meet. You know, I had friends, and their parents were you know chief executives of you know local authorities, and they were mm. doctors, and they were solicitors. And also, I think when you start to see you know behind the scenes, you realise you know these people are no different. You know, yeah. From from my dad, from my mum. And they, you know, they've obviously, they've worked exceptionally hard, but I used to think that to become a doctor or a sister, you had to be kind of superhuman. And I think that I certainly saw that, you know, it was, you know, with the opportunity that, you know, going to a grammar school gives you, um, that I could certainly go and, you know, do something that um, was... Um, respecting the you know the quality of education that I received. Yeah, no, it's, it's super interesting. With the you talked about um, chip on your shoulder. Um, do you think that's what drives most leaders? Do you think there's something being away at people just you know whether people don't feel good enough or someone bullied them when they're younger or do you think there's that a negative something negative in their life drives them to being from most of the people that you know and maybe lead some positions? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, I've, um, you know, from my group of friends, um, you know, there's, there's there's two kind of distinct camps. There's the the people that, you know, have come from, um, you know, middle, upper class families. Mm. And I think that those people are motivated probably through, you know, a sense of obligation and probably... Yeah a sense of uh you know needing to you know maintain the success that you know that family has enjoyed over the you know, generations before that for me and for some other of my friends um i think that the you know i wouldn't necessarily call it negative but certainly you know the motivation comes from a desire to want a better life um, and yeah. initially that was for myself and, you know, at the time my, my girlfriend. And, and now it's very much about uh, wanting, you know, a better life for my children. Um, mm. And um, I think that certainly from some of the, you know, developers that we lend to locally, they have, they're, they're similar. You know, they've come from working class, relatively poor backgrounds. Mm. Um, but they've got an opportunity and they've got a skill and they've got a drive that is often created through a need to just want to better life for themselves and their families. And, uh, and I think that's very common, absolutely. Who's been, so let's talk about when you finish university, so your first job in property, how did you get into it? How did it all happen? Well, I was, uh, I was, I was fresh out of university yeah. Uh, my I met my my now wife, uh, my girlfriend at the time, in the very latter stages of the first year of university. So we would have been eighteen, nineteen. So we've been together nearly now longer than we've been apart. Um, yeah. And at the end of uh, university, my wife was from Cheltenham, and obviously I'm from Bournemouth. And uh, it was early, you know, early summer. So I said, look. Uh, let's not make any you know long commitments to any place let's just go to Bournemouth for the summer because it's a great place to be mm. lovely beach new forest all that sort of stuff so we we left university uh, and at the time because you know we had student loans and we weren't working we were staying with my parents mm. um, which I was fine with I had no real desire to go and get a job immediately I thought that I would uh, you know, chill probably out, just it. chill out. It was the 2006. It was the you know the year of the World Cup. It was the it was the World Cup. It was the World Cup in yeah. in Germany. So I thought oh, I'm going to just uh, you know take a well earned rest because you know university is incredibly taxing. 
So I'm I'm probably watching a game and my wife says like this is just not going to work for me. I can't, you know, with you know, she loves my parents, but I cannot. Yeah. Uh, I cannot, I need your own space. So I'm going to go and get a job. So she went to a recruitment company and they said, we've got this, uh, this new business called Positive Lending, which is headed up by a, you know, a really inspirational chap, really experienced called Paul McGonagall. Go and have a, um, uh, an interview with him. He's setting up a a specialist mortgage brokerage. Mm. So she trots along to the interview and kind of halfway through, not, not because she didn't like Paul, but just because it wasn't for her. She just, you know, she was good at sales, but she just didn't want to work in financial services. She said, look, this isn't for me. And I suspect now in kind of retrospect, she went there knowing that she was going to introduce me halfway through. Um, <laughs> so I, she organized for me to have an interview the next day. So kind of yeah. begrudgingly, I stuck on my suit and yeah. I wandered down to, to go and meet Paul. And to be honest, I, I kind of half wanted to have the job because, you know, you know, I was there, you know, I wanted to, you know, do well in the interview because, yeah. you know, nobody Compassive wants to. Yeah. That, yeah. So we're, we're kind of chatting through the job and my background and what I've been doing at university and my experience. And after 45 minutes, Paul kind of turns around and said, look, I think you're, I think you're lovely. I think that, um, you know, but you're a bit of a risk. You're a bit of a risk, and ultimately, I don't think you've got enough sales experience to to make this work. So, um, you know, I think we'll, you know, we'll just we'll say no. I was like, okay, totally get it. Thanks for your time. And then afterwards, in that kind of you know post interview debrief, where it becomes a, a more informal, we were talking about, uh, yeah, I think what we're doing at the weekend, and. Yeah. I just happened to have tickets to the World Cup final mm. because my housemate at university, his father was the director of sport at ITV. Um, and obviously I'd lived with him at uni for three years. We were really good pals. So he invited uh, myself and three others to go mm. and watch the final in, in Berlin. Paul was a huge football fan, always has been. And after chatting, you know, informally for half an hour afterwards, he turned around to me and said, look, I, I, I think I've made a mistake. <laughs> Would you actually like to take the job? And that was it. I started, yeah. the, I started the following, you know, I went to the World Cup. I started on the 1st of August in, I think it was 2006. And I was a, a business development manager. So yeah. I, I was responsible for generating sales. And at the time we were exclusively selling secured loans. And this is mm -hmm. when, you know, 100, this is 2006, 125% mm -hmm. mortgages, you know, second charges, self sir And it was a, it was a wonderful environment. It was incredibly, um, it was incredibly fast paced. Yeah. Uh, you learned incredibly quickly. I mean, there are certain things, I mean, looking back now, uh, I remember, you know, somebody said, can you send this fax? I mean, this is when you still send faxes to people. And I was putting the paper in the wrong way. And yeah. I mean, I was just so green and just naive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, that business grew. We were part of a group of companies, around 20 companies, and every one in six secured loans were sold by this group. It was called the Vantage Group. And I did, you know, it was a relatively easy sell, to be honest, you know, the market, there was so much capital and the products were, you know, so racy that, um, you know, the commissions were so great that, um, you know, I did pretty well. And it was very, very intoxicating. The, you know, the fast paced sales environment, learning a, a new industry, but learning with, you know, somebody that had been doing it for 20 years and really knew his stuff. Mm. Um, but then also was quite, uh, supportive in in teaching you actually how to sell to people um, mm. and not the kind of traditional I don't know sort of, kind of like double glazing that sort of like techniques but you know basically listening you know really important mm. um, taking the time to uh, you know understand people and um, read people and also about integrity you know your mm. you know reputation is the most valuable thing you have as a, you know, as a salesperson, as an individual, and also as a, and as an organisation. And he definitely installed that in me, which was, you know, long term. Always take the long term view because mm. you, a deal is never worth a relationship 
Um, so you have to always, if you if you're in an environment where you have to start taking short term views, you know you should probably start thinking about exiting. You know, looking for something else because I think the writing's on the wall in businesses where you have to start to being, being short sighted. Do you think that uh, Paul was probably your biggest influence in this in this industry? Uh, he was certainly one of them, certainly one of them. Um, uh, later on, as the business grew and we would have, you know, strategic meetings with lots of specialist lenders, but at board level, you know, I had the, you know, the great opportunity to meet lots of, you know, the leaders of the financial services world. Mm. And I think one of the other big influences on me was the MD of uh, Precise Mortgages, uh, their okay. charter court. Um, yeah, bank. Uh, his name Alan Cleary, and he was um, he was. We, we used to go this on lots of you know we used to go on these strategy days and conferences, and we also used to you know go on lots of corporate hospitality. And Alan and I became quite good friends, mm. and I would always want to learn from him, and he would always be very um, generous with giving me information about the market, but not as a broker, but as a lender. And I knew even at that time, this would have been kind of 2014, 2015. For me, I knew that, you know, brokerages are, are great businesses. Mm. Um, but because we had the origination for bridging finance within the brokerage, I always knew that I would want to start a lending business. So I gained mm. so much insight on a one-to-one -one mm. basis from his, you know, his kind of kind of generous um, giving of his time yeah. that uh, I had a, a, a really good insight into how lending businesses work, you know, from somebody that had been involved with them for, for a long, long time and been very, very successful. Mm. So, uh, and also he was an absolute master of marketing and distributing mortgage products and also corporate hospitality. I learned that if you're going to, if you're going to give someone hospitality, don't do it by halves. And that is sometimes people, you know, they have a, they might have a budget and it might mean that people have to put their hands in their own pockets to enjoy that hospitality. Alan's mm. view was if something costs 20,000 mm. pounds and people walk away going, I thought that was really good, but I had to, you know, the bar stopped at, I don't know, eight o'clock and yeah. I had to buy the drinks. You're better off to spend 30,000 pounds and for mm. people to walk away thinking that you were absolutely brilliant, incredibly generous. You were, you know, you really wanted them to um, you know, not have to contribute to things financially. And he was just very, very thoughtful about, you know, what we would do, where we would go. And, uh, you know, I really learned a lot from him, um, not just about hospitality, but just, you know, how you, how you finance lending businesses, how it works into behind the scenes in terms of, you know, senior participation, junior participation, how interest payments work, structuring SPVs, you know, the detail of actually setting up a lending business uh, was learned mm. from from Alan. Mm. Did you? There's a lot. You know, there's a lot of people that might be listening to this that want to go into a certain area of business in property, but they don't have, you know, um, you know, someone that they can go to and actually learn from. Do, how would you suggest that someone strategically goes? If I want to be, you know, let's say, you've got someone that wants to be a property developer. If they want to learn to be a property developer, how what would your advice be as a, as a, as a leader in property? How you learn those the necessary skills to get to where you want to be? Well, I suppose there's the, there's two key ways. Like the first is like the best way to learn to be a property developer is to work for a property developer. Mm. Um, sounds obviously incredibly obvious, but the difficulty is that property development businesses are. Uh, they, they tend to have relatively small and highly experienced teams. Mm. So the opportunity for apprenticeships is actually is actually pretty small mm. because of the nature of the way that certainly most SME developers work is that, you know, 
Occasionally, they have internal kind of construction companies or land directors or land yeah. buyers, but often a lot of this resource is outsourced to third parties. So it could be that you know whenever a particular scheme comes up, they they find the opportunity, and then the actual construction is awarded via tender to a you know to a third party. Mm. So just by definition, the the opportunities that exist within property development are pretty small. So. Mm. I think it depends what area you want to be involved in. So do you want to be involved in the kind of acquisition side? So identifying opportunities. Do you want to be involved in the construction side? Do you want to be involved in the kind of accounting or the sales? And I suppose what you've got to do is if you can't directly get a job working for a developer you have to go and find something that will give you some of the skills in an area which is more accessible so for example you might go and work for an estate agency or mm. you might go and work for a construction or a, a contractor mm. and once you've got the necessary skills then going to the developer and uh, you know you'd have a far greater chance of you know, maybe being successful the other thing is is obviously you know you know there are lots of um, apprenticeships in you know various different parts of um, you know labor so carpentry mm. you know mm. plumbing uh, being an electrician so that's that's something you consider so kind of like the educational route um, mm. but you know it's um, you know it is a it is a it is a challenge I think to, um, to try and get into a developer at the moment. how important do you think it is Chris to be focused and maybe pick because you guys specialize in bridging isn't it so yeah how did you purposely go we want to be niche we want to be laser focused on x type of product and that's what we're going to go for and we're going to and it was that maybe learn from the chap that you um who was a master of marketing and kind of strategy and stuff that you talked about yeah no, the, the the simple reason that we went into bridging is because um, so this is 2017, I, I was running the brokerage um, and we were originating via, you know, lots of different sources, but predominantly via uh, intermediaries. We were originating around 200 million per year mm. of bridging business. So as a business, we were giving advice to clients about where they were best placed in placing their bridging requirements with and that was a number of different lenders obviously when you've got 200 million of originations you're kind of and you're giving it to th other third party lenders you kind of look and think Do you know what if we could raise capital and we could become the lender we have one of the hardest parts of the business partly organized already through our brokerage business mm. so you then just need to make sure that you're not prejudicing your uh, origination i.e mm. you know we could have been short-sighted and said you know we've got 200 million we are going to try and stick 100 million through a lending channel but the rate is going to be 20 percent higher than we can get in the market yeah again that's a really bad long-term mm. decision because ultimately you're just going to have uh disgruntled clients that are borrowed from you which is bad for the brokerage um, you're going to make a bit of money in the short term through the lender, but it's mm. it's certainly not going to build a good reputation. So what we had to do is to start really, really small. So we raised capital through some high net worth investors um, initially, and it was for, you know, about 10 million pounds. Mm. And we picked off the appropriate risk from positive mm. that we could be competitive within the market. So yeah. the, the customers were getting the same or a better outcome. Mm. The lender was making the margin on you know, what we would borrow from our investors and what we would lend. But also the brokerage was making the same margin by giving that piece of advice. So we were kind mm. of earning twice. Mm. And that model grew as the lending business was able to secure cheaper and cheaper and cheaper capital. So ultimately, you know, as our capital fell, because we were writing more business, more opportunity could come from positive because we could be competitive and we could offer the same rates that, that was available in the market. Mm. And for the first 12 months of Catalyst existence, we were reliant solely on the introductions from 
positive lending our sister company and then after that we started to move out into the intermediary market once we had you know proved the concept got the cost of capital down we had um, ironed out some of the issues with processing and operations and uh, yeah and then from then we have you know we have lent 250 million and we have a current loan book of 100 million and we're very much in a high growth part of the um, you know the journey right now because we have now made you know nearly 500 loans and we have redeemed you know 125 million um, of lending you know many 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 loans and ultimately what your investors are looking for certainly when you get to the institutional level is you know a track record um, mm -hmm. and we can now show that track record so our cost of capital is, is, is coming down and we can be even more competitive and you know compete for you know mm -hmm. some of the uh, you know for bigger market share how easy we're in such a rapid growth um, you know obviously having to take on more resources in terms of team members how what sort of journey has that been? Has that been quite straight, straightforward, or is it you, what sort of challenges you've had with growing the team this quickly? Uh, actually, recruitment hasn't been overly challenging. I mean, I suppose one of the areas that we we struggle with is the fact that we it's not like we're in central London, where within a thirty mile radius there's another twelve bridging lenders. Oh. Um, mm. There are, you know, there's one other, as far as I know, that operate, you know, on the south coast. And that makes recruiting a challenge because you can't just bring in, you know, people that have been working in bridging for three or four years already. So mm. you have to just take a slightly different approach. And what we've done is we've looked at people that have expertise within property. Mm. Uh, a lot of the, the salespeople have come from either a, a BDM position within a, a lender, but possibly not on a bridging or refurb or development basis, but possibly from one of the, like, the buy-to-let lenders, for example. Mm. And then, uh, or from like agency background, so they've got an experience of property and you know they've got quite a strong um, uh, work ethic in terms of you know, the, you know, the requirements of actually selling. Yeah, which is very much about you know you need to be uh, consistent and you need to you know continue to try and find new opportunity day in day out. Mm. Uh, so we've taken people that are kind of connected with property, but then we have to then spend more of our time in the early days in training. So we you know we have a really really good training program here, and in the early days it was delivered by me and. Mm as time goes on and the team grows, it becomes a little bit easier in fact, because because you've got more people, we go through a kind of a, a one week initiation or induction. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I'm a, re I'm a really big advocate of learning slowly mm -hmm. and it actually kind of going in rather than trying to have a two or three week induction where it's just totally and utterly overwhelming and people just don't really remember. Uh, people are given, you know, the expectation for people to kind of be ready to go out on their own is is is, is relatively long here. We we give them time to, you know, sit with their peers, you know, really understand the business. Um, and then, like I said earlier, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of baby steps. But the kind of downside to that is that, Whereas you might, if you're in a different location, you have the benefit of being able to bring in talent that can kind of hit the ground running. Mm. We just need to adjust our recruitment strategy to make sure we have, we don't have what I call a resource lag. And that is that because the incubation period between people being new and then being kind of ready to contribute, mm. you know, um, because that's longer, we need to make sure that we are having appropriate levels of recruitment earlier than other businesses. Yeah, yeah um, so which is mm. exactly, exactly that. So if we know that, for example, we've got a new product launch coming in 12 months time, mm. and we know we're going to need another six people, we can't leave it three months beforehand. We probably need to be bringing that in uh, certainly six months before. 
Would you say that's a skill set that's quite important for you as a as leader, planning? Or do you think you can, or, or do you think you can sort of delegate that to someone else, or do you think you really need to be on top of the planning? how you plan what you're moving forward. I suppose it's tied into your vision now as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you know, planning, you know, it, a, a business has to be organised, you know, and part of being organised is, is making sure that you're effectively planning. Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's critical, in fact, you know, the, the kind of idea that you can run a, a business, certainly a business of our, you know, of, of, of my kind of um, uh, nature, mm kind of making it up as you go along you know some people might be able to do that and you might you know get lucky but I yeah. think in order to maximize you know your efficiencies you know planning is absolutely critical and you know we we plan we, we don't plan on a kind of weekly basis other than kind of management of our uh, loan portfolio and our pipeline but certainly we're, we're certainly managing things on a on a quarterly basis and you know that's delivered through SMT meetings and stuff. Mm. What was your reaction when you first heard news about COVID? As a, as as a was your immediate reaction from a business perspective? Because obviously we were all worried about our families, and of course you would think about the safety of all your loved ones, of course. But let's take it from a business perspective. How did did you react immediately to looking at costs, or how did you? No, I suppose. Listen, when when when. You know, you, you, I think in December 19, you had the first, you know, the the outbreak in, in China. Mm. I think, you know, kind of everybody's reaction was, you know, this isn't going to affect us. You know, this isn't, yeah. this, isn't coming, this isn't coming our way. And then I think also, you know, I can remember my birthday's in March and I was out for dinner, you know, kind of probably like around, you know, the first week, maybe second week of March. And that was just before we were going into the first lockdown. And at that point, I think because there's a self-preservation, you, well, I certainly just looked at it and thought, you know, this is going to be, you know, three months and then, you know, everything's going to return to normal, um, which is How obviously- How we wrong. <laughs> com yeah, you know, com completely daft now. Mm. Um, but in terms of business, you know, we were kind of lucky. Um, in we hadn't really begun to scale massively so mm. there's kind of like during covid some of our peers that are much much bigger you know they've been in business for 40 years they stopped lending you know the first time in the company's right, history yeah. history they stopped lending and that's not because they couldn't necessarily manage the new risk because you can do that you know it's, it's constantly changing but you can mm. adjust to that it's more about the sheer difficulty in managing 700 people or 400 people or 200 people mm. that suddenly have to go from working, you know, as they've always experienced in an office to working remotely. Mm -hmm. um, we had probably during that time, you know, we put in the early teens in terms of headcount. So it was relatively easy. And also because of the age of the business, we already had systems in place and we were already using things like Microsoft Teams to, yeah. you know, people were working from home some of them one day a week already and we were communicating internally via teams anyway mm. that's not because we were smart it's just because we're young and we had the latest technology. system yeah. technology and yeah. systems in place um and then also we had no legacy issues in terms of our loan book because we we were a new lender the capital behind us was kind of like you have to prove that you can do this so mm. it's going to be baby steps and that was a godsend, you know, when COVID, we yeah. didn't have big exposure to leisure, hospitality, mm. commercial, big development sites, big loans, you know, on a liquid stock. Mm. We had a really, really neat little loan portfolio that mm. actually, you know, there were lots of, you know, forbearance requests as you'd expect, but we weren't getting, we didn't have a loan book of 25,000 customers for, mm. you know, 2.5 billion that just caused complete chaos during lockdown. And I can, I can remember writing an all hands email like mid pandemic that was titled something like um, disrupt during disruption, which was yeah. basically saying this is an opportunity for us. You know, ordinarily in financial services, it's good to be a super tanker. Mm. 
at the moment, it's actually better to be a speedboat. And yeah. we are a speedboat. We can do things quickly. We can be really agile. We're not beholden to, you know, we're privately owned. Um, so we can make changes really, really quickly. And we don't have any of the operational headaches compared mm. to our peers. And the, the kind of statement was, we need to go out, our capital is diversified, and they are supportive. You know, we slightly pulled back on risk, but they are supportive yeah. of continuing to fund loans during the pandemic. We continued funding loans throughout the whole of the period, mm. um, whilst others were pulling back. And being quite frank, the kind of discussion internally was, you know, the brokers that ordinarily wouldn't have really looked twice at Catalyst because they've got four or five lenders that they've done business with for the last five years, suddenly when they start saying, actually, we're shut, it was an opportunity for us to get our foot in the door. Um, yeah. And we massively grew our introducer base during, you know, during the last 12 months. And mm -hmm. you know, now we've got to fight to keep them because those other lenders are now back in the market, mm -hmm. you know, and they're not just going to, you know, say, oh, you know, we've been, you know, we've been shut for 12 months and, yeah. you know, we're kind of happy. You know, it's only right that, you know, we were shut. These guys can keep them. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's, it's tough. Yeah. You know, it's a competitive environment. Um, and we're just, you know, continuing to make sure that we can, you know, keep these brokers using us. On a, on a personal level, from as a, as a business leader, um, within property, do you find it easy to switch off, or do you do you pretty much think about work twenty four seven? The only time I switch, away? the only time I switch off this week, Tim, is for our very important upcoming game on Sunday, <laughs> the semi finals of the Veterans Dorset Cup. Um, We're getting old. We are getting old. Um, no. <laughs> Is it, is it on? Yeah. How do you? How it's twenty. Do you it's twenty four seven. It's twenty four seven. Yeah. It's, you know, do, you, do, you, do you do you go to the gym? Do you meditate? What do you do to try and? Is there any? You know, look, you've come from you know, like you said, not a business background. You've grown. You've grown one business. You're now growing another business. You know, very successful. Clearly, um, are there? Is there anything that you recognise that you do that aids that success? Um, and especially from a health and well-being side, maybe as well, anything yeah, sport-related. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. For, I, I did a sports science degree, um, so I think one of the options for me was was definitely to have some form of, um, you know, employment within sport or to have a business within sport. And I set up during university. One of my first businesses was a, a youth sports camp where we had referrals from the NHS. Mm. Um, sport has played a massive, massive part in my life and continues to do so. I'm I find myself, uh, I get, you know, a lot of negative energy um, if I do not exercise. And it's, you know, my, you know, my hobbies are quite broad in sport. I, you know, I play football. I like running. I've recently, you know, started to, to cycle a little bit more because, mm. you know, my running day is not going to last forever. So I'm yeah. you know, thinking about the next, <laughs> next 20 years. Um, and I find it incredibly um, cathartic and I find it incredibly therapeutic um, and it really does go a long way to you know keeping my mental health in check and it's certainly one of the things during lockdown um, that I was very mindful of and I'm uh, very lucky to live relatively close to the beach so you know during winter and spring summer I would be you know, I'd go off for a half an hour run if I was feeling that something was, you know, stressing me out. And yeah. I find that my mind just, anything, when I'm running or I'm playing sport, it, I'm so focused on what I'm doing that it's a total distraction. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a way in which I can forget about, you know, that deal that, you know, is, is maybe gone a bit wrong and, you know, we're trying to find a solution to it. Or, you know, some of the challenges of, you know, being a you know parent to two young ch children and also, you know, trying to run a business, you know, that brings its own uh, pressures. Uh, and also that's the thing is, you know, it's alone time. You know, you're, you're on your own often, certainly when you're running. And you can, you know, it's also, I find also it, uh, sometimes when I start and I've got a problem towards the end, despite the fact that I've not thought about it, a solution mm. just kind of, it, it, it becomes more apparent. Mm. So, um, yeah, exercise is, you know, incredibly important to me. And, um, 
how do you um how do you how do you learn Chris? Have you but do are you someone that would read or watch videos or just kind of learn from just being around other people? How is that something? Is, is it something? Is, is, yeah, is there any of those things that you kind of you enjoy doing? I, I don't read a huge amount, uh, truth be told. Um, I do, you know, I read, you know, trade press and that sort of stuff. Yeah. But the way that I've learned in this business is by being exposed to, you know, lots and lots of very, very talented people. Um, yeah. And I suppose I was very lucky in that, you know, just because of how things panned out, I had a quite a senior position at a very young age. Mm. So I've had a long time to be in you know, a business where we were, you know, I was just very lucky to be, you know, dealing with boards, you know, of, mm. you know, really, you know, big, big, big lenders, you know, with like mm. multi billion pound loan books. And you, you know, you see how these people operate and, you know, you have you to take, learn fast. You have to learn fast, but also, you know, mm. you, you have to also, um, you have to learn fast, but you also, it's not so much about their um it's it's kind of like also the way in which they organize themselves and the way in which they treat people um you know i can honestly say that the people that i've worked with when i've been you know when i was the md of positive you know they all shared the same trait which was they were incredibly polite incredibly respectful they would always be, um, you know, they would always bend over backwards to help, you know, people in their team. Mm. And this, I think there's, there's this kind of like common, commonly held view that people in financial services, certainly in lending businesses are quite mercenary and quite tough. Um, as, as far as I'm concerned, and you know, I've, I've been, you know, I've, I've seen inside, you know, the you know, board level of, you know, most of the, the biggest lenders in the UK, it, it is nothing could be further from the truth. They are, mm. you know, incredibly nurturing environments, and they're all, you know, you, you only get to that position by uh, being incredibly supportive, and, and ultimately by being a nice person. You know, my my mum says that you know you should look after people on the way up because you know they'll look after you on the way down, and um, I think that's that's so true. What's the um, if you could step into my shoes, what? Would you have asked yourself that I I didn't? So basically, are there any question, questions that I've missed out? That you well, I think se seeing as it's a property show, I think the the kind of obvious one at the moment is about uh, you know the challenges that you know the high street is facing in mm. terms of um, you know th this terrace that I'm sat on overlooks you know probably a secondary high street and there's just vacant you know shop after vacant shop. After vacant and I think that's a picture up and down the country. So I suppose, you know, what's the solution to that? And I think it's something that, you know, is, is going to take a bit of time. But, you know, my view on it is that, you know, this is this is valuable space. It's, you know, it's it's in the middle of, you know, highly high density areas in terms of, you know, populations. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a prevalence of, you know, the world is moving to online delivery. So whether there's something that can be done in terms of utilizing this space for, you know, distribution, I know that, you know, yeah. for us as a lending business, we, you know, we, we like, you know, distribution centers, you know, but often they're not in the center of town. Mm. Um, but is there a way in which, you know, it can be used for that purpose? Because clearly that's a growth area for, you know, it's going to continue, you know, for, for many years to come. Mm. And also I think that there has to be reform to planning. So I think it's highly likely that we're going to see, you know, the, you know, the lower high street um, yeah. kind of go and the high street is going to consolidate so that the experience for the, you know, the consumer is smaller, but it's much more relevant and it's better. So yeah. people are actually yeah. going to be compelled to go, you know, to the high streets because mm. I think there is still definitely a space for people to, you know, leave the house and to go and, you know, to, you know, have experience led, 
events, things like, you know, mm. hospitality, restaurants, you know, those sorts mm. of things, they're going to continue. Uh, and also in terms of planning reform, I think it's likely that, you know, the lower high street that is pot potentially, if it can't find alternative uses, mm -hmm. it's going to have to, you know, there's going to have to be adaptation in terms of planning to make, you know, its conversion into a use which is viable mm. and ultimately brings about, you know, its occupation. Um, they're going to have to make that slightly easier. Um, the, and the most obvious one's the residential, isn't it? But you know, a lot of these, a lot of these properties just aren't suitable for residential use. Do you have any alternative? Is that are you thinking along the lines of residential, or are you thinking along the lines of something, something else? Obviously, you touched on distribution. Yeah, I don't think that. Um, listen, I, there's only so many. Like the world is changing, and the need for shop, like a certain square meters of shop front, is probably reducing. So unless there's a viable alternative, you know, there's only so many hairdressers, beauticians, you know, vape the, shops, yeah, the vape yeah, shops, yeah. exactly yeah. that you can have. So I think that residential is a clear opportunity, but I'm not in favor of having ground floor retail repositioned as residential because ultimately mm. having, you know, you know, first of all, who wants to live on a, you know, with people walking past their window all yeah, day long every two seconds yeah so i think what you've got to do instead is 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 almost kind of say okay like this ground floor element is totally unviable commercially so mm. let's put in planning reform that allows the parts that are viable you know the uppers to say okay you know let's allow a certain level of increase in terms of floors under some form of permitted development mm. that then makes the scheme viable for developers despite the fact that the ground floor is also be, it's kind of yeah. redundant that could ground floor a lobby for example couldn't it? a sort of, lobby yeah. it could be a gym it could yeah. be and but also you could then start looking at being you know if if the rent is significantly lower could it then be handed back to the local authority and used for other purposes um mm. you know that's something which you know could, could be explored as well Mm, it's very, very interesting. What do you think, so you touched on obviously the retail environment for, 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 for real estate. What do you think the future of, you know, I know it's quite a broad, big question, but kind of the future of lending your business in particular, bridging, do you see it being continued, uh, you know, a market that's going to continue to grow? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, if you look at it 10 years ago, the market was you know, relatively esoteric in nature. You had you know, not many, certainly in the intermediary space, not many people, if they would probably know what a bridging opportunity was. And the market has become more fragmented in terms of lenders over the course of the last 10 years. And now, you know, most intermediaries would very easily be able to recognize a bridging opportunity. And they have a number of solution providers to go and, um, you know, to go to, to, to help them out. I think the next five years is, you know, the market is becoming increasingly competitive. And ultimately, there's only, I don't think the market is going to grow massively in terms of new lending opportunity, maybe slightly. But ultimately, I think what you're going to see is that there will be an element of consolidation. So I think the, the people mergers, that just, yeah. Yeah. mergers, but also I think that there'll just be, there'll be people that just, they'll just drop stop, out. drop out. Yeah. yeah because unless you get your capital right and you can compete you know gone are the days now where you could probably make a you know a business out of um you know picking up the odd opportunity that had such a high risk adjusted return because of a relationship um the market's just way too competitive for that and ultimately you know consumers are going to source a better opportunity and you're going to lose the you know the opportunity to lend so uh, my expectation is we'll see, you know, a market that currently has, you know, well in excess of probably a hundred lenders, you know, probably 40 of those are institutional and mm. the other ones, the smaller ones that are kind of very much regionally focused. I think that, you know, they may find some challenges, um, you know, over the course of the next five years. Interesting stuff. What are the three most important skills you need to master in order to be successful in property, would you say? Reliability. Um, I think you also, you know, as I was kind of saying, y you need to be relevant. So mm. your proposition, you know, needs to be competitive. You can't have a bad proposition and sell it 
generally with a good salesperson. So great salespeople, in my opinion, can't sell rubbish products. Mm. You need to be relevant, and that needs to constantly adapt to make sure that you know you are you, know, you have your finger on the pulse in terms of what you're offering your your consumers. Um, and also, I think personality. I think that's important. I think mm. you need to. Uh, you know, certainly within this business, we deal with lots of professional intermediaries and, you know, where the margins now between lender A, lender B, lender C are becoming smaller, the mm. difference can be the fact that, you know, you are a bit more of a personality and yeah. also, you know, you build, you do build up friendships in this business. Mm. Um, and I'm not against loyalty and I'm not against people giving business to their, you know, people that they know better. Mm. But it, it can only be when, you know, it's not at the detriment of the consumer in terms of price. So for me, it's about, you know, be a great bloke, uh, sell a great product and consistently deliver it. Mm. Thank you so much for your time, Chris. I really appreciate my, it. Okay. My pleasure. And take care. Thanks very All much. Right. Thanks All for the best today. Day.